a little bit. So, been in this series that I like to call Spiritual Things in Church. And you might say, well, that sounds silly. Well, maybe it is silly, but there's a lot of spiritual things can happen in church and not necessarily of the right spirit. There's uh, churches that are torn asunder from a spirit of criticism. There are churches that are torn apart by uh, uh, envy and strife and all of these things that have no place in the kingdom of God. So, started out this series called with a, a message called, It's All About Love. The reason that we uh, pursue God, the reason that we pursue the Holy Spirit, the reason that we seek to operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit is all about love for one another. Love for God, love for the kingdom of God, love for those who don't yet know Jesus. And if it's not all about love, well then, uh, like 1 Corinthians 13 says, we're a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. It's all about love. And the second week we said, talked about the way of the Spirit. There is a way that the Holy Spirit operates. And we have to get in the way of the Spirit and not be in the way of the Spirit, right? So, the third week then we looked at, we said, different is good. Take a look at your neighbor and say, you're different. That's right. We are all different. And it's a good thing we are different. This is not cookie cutter uh, way of looking at things. We have different things that motivate us. We have passions that are just a little bit different. But when they're directed in love to seeking God for what He has for us so that we can be a blessing to others within the church and those outside of the church, well then we find out that different is good. And then two weeks ago, we, we took a, a side trip over to Galatians 5 and talked about the fruit of the Spirit. And I said, don't forget the fruit. A lot of times in, in churches, depending upon their tradition, they'll you'll have one church that's really heavy on manifestation gifts and forsakes the, talking about the fruit of the Spirit. And you'll have other churches that all they do is talk about fruit, and they don't talk about the manifestation gifts or the other gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's both. We don't neglect either. Yeah. So, if we say uh, that God is uh, using us in these spiritual gifts, we certainly also want the Holy Spirit to produce fruit in our lives. If we're miserable and we're nasty to people, or we're living an unholy life, or we are not uh, living godly in general, we can still be used in the gifts of the Spirit, but not in the fruit. Let me explain that to you. We've been looking in 1 Corinthians, and I've told you this a few times now. Paul wrote this letter to the church in Corinth in response to a letter that was written to him. And there were situations in this church where it wasn't an issue of not being used in the gifts of the Spirit. Their issue was they had some moral failings. They had some, some things where they were immature. And they really needed to grow up in Christ. And they needed to allow God to transform them continually uh, into people that would look less like the world and more like Jesus. Do you want to look like Jesus? Huh? Do you want to be like Jesus? Three of you? Seriously? Do you want to be like Jesus? Yeah. Amen. Keep that in mind. We may revisit that a few times today. So, uh, to think that, that people who are used in spiritual gifts are somehow the upper echelon. No, no, no. He makes it available for all believers. But at the same time, we do not forsake what it means to live holy lives. And today, I already gave you a hint. This message be like Jesus. And the Sunday school answer, whenever you say, why do you come to church? To learn about God and Jesus, right? Well, take it a step further, and I ask you, do you want to be like Jesus? People say, absolutely. Well, just keep that in mind as we look into a passage of Scripture today from 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to look at verses 7 through 11. I encourage you to get your Bibles out. Uh, this is the only slide we're going to have, so if you have room on the back of your bulletin and you'd like to take some notes, I encourage you to do that. Uh, I'm reading from the uh, New American Standard Bible this morning. When you, when you compare versions of the Bible on passages like this, boy, you get a lot of different words. And I like NASB for a study 
to study from. Uh, it reads pretty well. I like the New Living Translation uh, to read for Bible reading. Uh, a lot of good translations out there. But uh, the NASB has kind of been called the American King James Bible because it's, it's pretty honest. It's, it's an accurate word for word as much as that can be done. Uh, translation. Uh, and so we're just going to use this to start with. So let me just read through this passage. And then we'll come back and talk about being like Jesus. Starting at verse 7. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. You want to be like Jesus, huh? It's okay to say yes. Yes, <laughs> You're not too sure what I'm up to, are you? <laughs> yeah. You, you're not quite sure what you're committing yourself to. Well, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be clear as we go along here. I'd like to just kind of look at some of these and kind of give a, a general overview of these. It's, when we talk about gifts of the Spirit, especially in our Pentecostal tradition, these are the nine that rise to the surface. These are the ones that we seem to talk about most often. And within some of these are the ones that probably are the most misunderstood, that get the most fake news uh, uh, mentioned about them, uh, that people will go through their entire life sitting in a church pew and hear teaching on this, and somehow they're afraid to admit that they don't quite understand it, because after all, we're a Pentecostal church. And I want you to feel free to not understand, and I'm going to do my best to try to help you understand. And maybe those of you who are watching by live stream, by the way, nice to have you with us. Uh, maybe there's some things that you have heard or been told or a little bit confused about some of these things. And we're certainly not going to make this an exhaustive uh, study today or we'd be here for a long time. But there, there's other weeks for that. But I want to kind of do a little bit of an overview. But I want you to keep something in mind. When we read through the list of these gifts and a description of what they are. I want you to remember the Gospels. I want you to remember the life of Jesus and the earthly ministry of Jesus. And I want you to think in your mind, when have I seen in the pages of the Gospels Jesus set the example in being used by God in these gifts? And I think the more you think about that, I'm going to give you some examples, but you're going to come up with a whole lot more. There are some that go together. There, uh, there, there are some that work together. It's, it's not like we have to, can, can we not draw these boxes so firmly? Can we not draw these lines so darkly? Can we just accept the fact that the Holy Spirit is going to use us in these ways? And it's not like Okay, I'm going to be used in wisdom from here to here, and then I'm going to be used, right? Can we have a holistic approach to this yeah. and, and not try to put such hard lines around it? And also understand, this is, this is representative. This is not exhaustive. And, and also, I've got to remind you of this. When Paul was writing this letter, he didn't write this to prove that these things existed. They had no problem understanding that these things existed. This was the normal practice of the church. This is something that God ordained the church to be involved in. This is not something odd or weird or new. This is something that from the day of Pentecost, the believers in Jesus Christ, as, as we look through the book of Acts, we see it started with the apostles, but then it went down to the deacons, and then we can see that ordinary believers in Jesus Christ were used in uh, 
extraordinary ways. No, no, it wasn't that Paul had to prove or that there were naysayers. That wasn't the issue at all. They, they freely operated in the gifts of the Spirit. Their problem was they weren't mature. And Paul was trying to teach them a little bit about living a sanctified life. So, it's not necessarily all. It's not necessarily the only things that God can manifest himself, that the Holy Spirit manifests in. Uh, but this is a good representation. And some of them naturally go together. The first two mentioned go together, a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge. Uh, wisdom is a supernatural solution to a problem. A supernatural solution to a problem. Now, we can go to school and we can learn how to do problem solving. Uh, we can be adept at that. We can perhaps be in a position in our job that we're used to problem solving. But this is more than that. This is, this is something that is not studied. This is something that is not planned, that the Holy Spirit gives you a download, a word of wisdom, a, a, a message from heaven that says, here is the solution to the problem. And we find that Jesus was used in this. How? Most of the teaching he did was in parables. He told stories. So, I, I've heard it through the years, people knocking preachers who tell stories. Well, Jesus did it. Why not tell a story to illustrate biblical truths? Jesus did it all the time. And he told stories mainly about agriculture because the people he uh, taught and, and preached to were used to that or about fishing, right? So, we can see that God, through the Holy Spirit, who was dwelling in Jesus, which I know makes our brains hurt because He was fully God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all one, but yet distinct uh, parts, distinct personalities of the Trinity. But Jesus Himself, in His flesh, needed the Holy Spirit. That's, that makes your brain hurt to really think about this. But he was 100% man, 100% God. But in his earthly ministry, the Holy Spirit gave Jesus wisdom in how he would teach biblical truths in parables. And what goes along with that is a word of knowledge, a, an understanding of a situation or of a fact that there's no way you could have learned it. Some of you have experienced this, I'm sure. Uh, Maybe there's a, a group of people who are assembled together like this, and you sense somebody, somebody here is, is going through a deep trial. Maybe you even feel the anguish. Has that ever happened to you? Maybe there's someone is suffering with something in their body, and maybe you even, part of that body hurts, and you don't know why. Maybe that's a word of knowledge that something is going on. See, these gifts are talking about the operation of these gifts is primarily in when we come together as a church. When you come together, these are the things that you can expect. So, wisdom and knowledge go together. If there's a, a knowledge about something, you may not know who it is, but then God can give you or somebody else wisdom. How can we do this? Knowledge may be somebody is going through some deep water right now. Wisdom can be, let's stop right now and pray for that person. We see that happen in our first Sunday nights, don't we? There's a real, a, a real uh, freedom in the house. We, we come with no agenda. We come with no, usually no song list, and certainly no message. And we come together, and before you know it, someone shares a word, and it, 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 it means something to somebody else, and we end up going on the road around the sanctuary praying for people and having times. And, and, and this, I believe, is probably closer to the early church than what we do today, right? doesn't mean that we can't do some different things. It doesn't, it, it honors God. But wisdom and knowledge working together in our meetings, this, these are two gifts of the Holy Spirit. And then the next on the list is faith. It's an unusual knowing that God is going to come through. It's a time where you just feel something welling up within you and you say, I know. Now, that can be applied to a number of different things. That can be applied with healing, right? I, I just know that it's time that we're going to pray for this person and they're going to be healed. It's more than saving faith. 
it's not just saving faith. It's not the faith we need to receive salvation. It, it goes beyond that. It's faith that God is going to move a mountain. Huh? That he's going to move a mountain. And you just know it. You know, uh, I got ahead of myself. Uh, word of knowledge, if we want to see how Jesus operated in that, think about it when he met the woman at the well, John chapter 4, at the well in Sychar, Samaria. And he knew what she had gone through without her telling him. And he said, uh, he asked, and then he used wisdom by asking a question. What was the question? Where, where's your husband? He had knowledge that she didn't have a husband, however, she had had five. And the one she was with now was not her husband. That was the knowledge, but the wisdom was asking the question, where is your husband? So faith, again, uh, we see Jesus at work in faith. In Mark chapter 11, right, when he curses the fig tree, made no fruit ever grow on you again. And when they came back the next day, they saw that the, the fig tree had withered, and his uh, uh, disciples were just amazed that all he had to do was speak this, and, and, and the fig tree died. He showed his disciples what it meant to have faith. And he, exa he, he, he further exemplified that by saying, you know, paraphrasing, this is nothing. If you have faith, you can tell this mountain right here to be cast into the sea. If you have faith, anything, nothing will be too hard. Jesus exemplified that kind of faith. Now, I've never expected or asked a mountain to go into the sea. But maybe someday God will ask me to do that. We, we put figurative language in all this stuff. We're real quick to say, well, he didn't really mean. Says who? Says who? Says us? Who like to make Jesus just into one of us? I don't know what the purpose would be to move a mountain into the sea, but maybe someday we'll find out. But it's a gift of the Spirit. It's a sudden understanding that I can have faith for this. I know it comes from God. I can have faith for this. This is all part of being like Jesus. I think you figured out where I'm going. Healing. Healing. Supernatural. Supernatural gift of the Spirit. God always does the healing, right? Those who have been used by God in gifts of healing are not the healer. God is the healer. Amen. But it's a supernatural. God, God chooses some people to seem to have the faith to pray for physical healing. Now, as, as a child of God, we don't have to have somebody pray for us, right? We have the authority to come before the, the very throne room of heaven and, and ask for healing. We have that authority because of what Christ did on Calvary. There's a whole lot more available to us as believers in Christ than most of us realize. It's not telling God what to do. It's appropriating what he's already paid for. But there are those that God has used in miraculous ways. They seem to have a healing ministry. We think of some of the evangelists and revivalists of the past that were well known for that. Or Roberts, for example, Benny Hinn, different people that God has miraculously used. Uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to argue with facts. There have been men and women that God has used supernaturally in healing. And I think as far as how Jesus did that, I don't believe we have to search too hard because one of the greatest uh, aspects of his earthly ministry was healing. I remember the, the story of the man uh, who was trying to get faith, right? Trying to have faith for his son. If you are willing, if you are able. And Jesus said, say what? If? Probably didn't say, say what? He certainly was able. He healed. He raised people from the dead. It was all part of being Jesus. Still want to be like Jesus? Amen. Miracles. Miracles, that's a broad category, against the natural order of things. Uh, I used to go, when I was on the road ministry, to a church up near Syracuse. And uh, this pastor of this church 
had incredible faith. Syracuse is an area that gets tons of snow, right? Tons of snow. And uh, he would start praying when a big snowstorm was coming through because he said, it's important that we get together on Sunday morning. And I don't know how many times he would pray and the storm would go around this section of Syracuse. I don't understand that. I don't understand that. Uh, but I've seen it happen. There are, there are times where God equips ordinary men and women who are born again following Jesus to work in miracles. Now, we can see miracles uh, coinciding with faith, coinciding with healing, right? All of these things, like what I said, don't draw too hard of a line or too big of a box around these things because they all work together. And certainly Jesus in the Gospels, we see many examples of miracles, that he could calm the sea, that he could walk on the water. Creative miracles like the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, where they started out with uh, tangible items, uh, five loaves and two fish, and he took that and blessed it, and they kept breaking it, breaking it, distributing it. And not only did they have enough, they had 12 baskets full left when they were done, right? This is a creative miracle. This is something that we see in Jesus. We see that Jesus embodied all of these things that we're talking about this morning. And then we have prophecy. Prophecy is interesting because it fits in a lot of different categories. One of the ministry gifts of the church from Ephesians 4 is prophet. So there are those that God chooses maybe we we'll say on a permanent basis or on a, a part-time basis or a resident gift, as many people will call it. Uh, people who are using the prophetic on a regular basis. But in this context, we're talking about when we get together and worship. And it could be that God would use any of us in, in a time to give a word of prophecy. Well, what is prophecy? Well, it's a foretelling of the truths of heaven. It's, it's a statement that we receive from heaven itself. We are to test the prophecies that we hear. We don't believe everything comes down the pike but we are based and firmly rooted and grounded in the Word of God. So if we hear something claiming to be uh, from God that does not agree to His character and nature as revealed in the Scriptures, well then we have to be suspect. Not so much of the person because we can all make mistakes, but we have to understand that just because somebody says, thus saith the Lord, does not necessarily mean thus saith the Lord, right? Uh, we have to have room in this whole thing for learning. We have to have room in this whole thing for a little bit of grace, a little bit of grace. We're not always going to hit the nail every single time, but it should not prevent you from seeking to be like Jesus. Amen. Prophecy, uh, momentary. Jesus was used in this, although we don't have the benefit of understanding how much he already knew and how much perhaps in his flesh the Holy Spirit was speaking at the time. But how many times did he prophesy his death, the way he would death, and his resurrection? And we know that the apostles got hung up on death so many times they missed the part about resurrection. And they were surprised when that actually happened. But I don't know at times it seems like out of nowhere perhaps that God reveals something to you. Uh, oftentimes if we have a message in tongues, interpretation becomes prophecy because it's an interpreted uh, the speaker in tongues perhaps has no idea what they're saying. Sometimes the same person will interpret, but other times somebody else will. And we receive that and we say that God has chosen to speak to his people in this miraculous way. None of these things do we own. None of these do we possess. Just because God used somebody one week in one particular gift, the next time we get together, maybe there won't be used, somebody else will be. We're all different, and it's all about love. Distinguishing of spirits, that's an interesting one. Uh, different translations call it different things. Discerning of spirits. Uh, one translation for the word is judging. Uh, we've been told that that word shouldn't come out of our mouths, but there's a biblical judging. Yes. 
it means that we are just simply discerning. Discerning. Is this of God or isn't this of God? It's not presuming to know what's in another's heart. That's not discerning of spirits. That's judging. That's judging. When you presume to know the heart and the motivations of somebody who has not told you, that's judging. That gets us in trouble. But discerning where the message comes from, that is something that we are all responsible for. Too many times people have gotten into trouble because they're not grounded here and they hear the word of a prophet who sometimes spell the word wrong. And they, they change their whole life and they give up everything and they find out later they did not discern the word. So we are responsible to discern the word. Jesus when he was over in the Gadarenes. Mark 5 is one example. The, the man who was, uh, had, had the, all the demons in him, right? He called out, who are you? And the demon said, we are legion, or we are many. Jesus discerned that this madman, who apparently the community just put up with, Jesus discerned that he was not just an insane man, but that he was demon-possessed. He recognized the spirit that was exemplified by this man as he was saying and doing the things that he was doing. Jesus is our example in discerning these things. We must be discerning. You know, discernment is more than just a word to use to say that, well, I discern the nicer things in life. I'm very discerning. We even, one of the cat food commercials had for cats who have discerning taste. <laughs> it's more than that. It's, it's knowing God, being rooted in His Word, having an experience with Him, being filled with His Holy Spirit, so that when something comes down the pipe that is not God, we will recognize it. So needed today. So needed today. And then probably the one gift mentioned in this list that gets the most press, and yeah, we're going to take another week and talk about this, is tongues. A message in an unknown language, an unlearned language by the speaker. It means that they're not just simply speaking in another language that they know. Some of you here know some other languages or another language or maybe part of some. I know enough Spanish to get me into trouble, and when I went to Mexico, I found that out real quick. Uh, but we're talking about an unlearned language and, and a momentary, a momentary thing. This is when we are gathered together in worship. Someone may have a message, something burning within them, and we hear it all the time. It's like there's something here that's got to come out, but I don't know what God's trying to say. God will use us in a language of heaven or sometimes an earthly language that we don't know. And it is proclaimed and someone gives the interpretation. Now, it's interesting. These last two, tongues and interpretation of tongues, are two things that we never see Jesus used in. But I ask you a question. Why would we have a record of that? This is before Calvary, and this is before Pentecost. What use would it be in Jesus' earthly ministry for him to speak in a language unknown by the hearers if there was no one there to interpret? Amen. You ever wonder what the original language of earth was? You ever wonder what the language was at Babel? I heard someone pontificate one time and said they believe that it would be equated to when we speak in an unknown tongue. I don't know if that's true or not, but I do know that God understands we're spirit to spirit. We're motivated by the Holy Spirit. We're speaking by the Spirit, and we are speaking great truths and praises to God, even though we don't know what we're saying. 
There are so many different uses and applications for the gift of tongues that we're going to take some more time, maybe even two weeks on this whole issue, because I want you to understand, and I want you to embrace the truth, and I want you to reject the lies in this. Most people uh, who find out we're a Pentecostal church, they're okay with praising the Lord. They're okay with shouting. They're okay with praying for the sick. They're okay even with words of knowledge and wisdom. But when it comes to tongues, boy, that's like, ah, getting out of this place, that's demonic. So quick to attribute this to Satan simply because they don't understand it. And I don't want any of you here to misunderstand it or to reject it. We are to be like Jesus. And just because we do not see Jesus being used in this way in the Gospels does not mean that it does not come from God. It was not something that you saw before Pentecost, only after. And there's a reason for that, because the Holy Spirit has come to live within us. And if we are open to Him completely filling and immersing us in His Holy Spirit, then we can expect that as God chooses, we can be used in these miraculous gifts of interpretation of tongues. That's in the language of the people assembled. And like I mentioned before, that can be understood as prophecy. There again, Jesus, do we have record of him doing that? No, of course not, because no one else would have been able to give a message in tongues, because as of yet, the Holy Spirit did not come to dwell within each. There is so much richness to this. If we can take ourselves back as best we can to first century Corinth, and understand that this was a church made up of people. These, th th this was like, they didn't leave another church to come to this. This was it. This was the first time. This was the, the, the people coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus. Some of them came from Judaism. Some of them came from paganism. They lived in a society that frowned upon what they did. Uh, Romans tolerated uh, the Jews, but after a time, they certainly didn't tolerate the Christians. And all these strange things were happening. No one taught them how to do it. They didn't have TV to turn on and watch an evangelist try to teach them how to be used in these things. This was simply a result of the Holy Spirit coming into them. And we have made such a hard line between non-Pentecostal and Pentecostal. I said last week, they didn't just one day decide, hey, let's be Pentecostal. This is how the church was born. Without the Holy Spirit, there can be no church. Yes, we can have an organization, and we can do events, and we can hold services. We can even craft prayers. We can sing songs, and we can come up with talks and messages, but it doesn't mean the Holy Spirit's in it. For the church to be the church, for the church to be like Jesus, we need the Holy Spirit, and not just enough to get your toes wet. I'm talking about all in, all in, a consecrated life. I do not want you to say, I've gone far enough. I do not want you to say, that's not for me. I do not want you to think that this is for professional clergy. I want you to understand this is for all believers in Jesus Christ. Verse 11 says, One and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. It is the one and only Holy Spirit that decides who gets what, for what day, for what time, for what purpose, for what hour. And when we let Him do what He wants to do. And when we live in expectation, could this be the day that God uses me in this way? Could it be today that when I come before him and say, Lord, I want everything you have for me, that he just downloads heavenly power into us? Absolutely. We should live expecting that. We should live celebrating that. We should not shy away from it, be ashamed of it, worry about what someone thinks about it. But we also take that say, Lord, I want the sanctified life. I, I want to live like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus in every way. I want to be like Jesus and follow his example and how he was used in this way. But I also want to keep in mind that the more I'm like Jesus, the less I'm like the world. That's going to inform my actions and my reactions and my attitudes. 
toward these things. You know, Moses, when he led the children of Israel out of Egypt, they had been slaves for 400 years. And in God's timing, he had a man named Moses. And as most of his prophets were, he started out kind of unwilling. How many have ever been there? You feel God saying, call on you to do something, and you're kind of like, send somebody else as other people more gifted. Yeah, I think anyone who's following Jesus in ministry has been there. Matter of fact, I believe he, he works better with people who don't have an uh, idea of greatness or success. So Moses leading these however many people, million, million people, out of Egypt's bondage, beginning of Exodus says that there's a Pharaoh that came along that did not know Moses. I mean, did not know uh, Joseph. Yeah. And uh, so they, they went from being uh, living in Egypt peacefully and prospering to being made slaves. So in the right time, of course, they come out and they start this long journey. It took them 40 years. Didn't have to. About a 10-day trip to get to the Jordan River to enter the Promised Land. Right off the bat, they complained, didn't they? They were out of Egypt, but they complained. They were not slaves any longer, but yet they whined, and they complained about what once was. They had selective memory. They forgot. They said, well, at least we had food to eat. Now we got to eat this lousy manna. They, they, they forgot what God had freed them from. And because of disobedience, two years takes them to the, to the Jordan River, two years, and they were, most of them anyway, were overwhelmed by what they saw on the other side. There was so much more for them on the other side of the river into the promised land. There was so much more. And, and for two years, God, through Moses, was telling them, look, there's more. There's more coming. All you got to do is just trust. And when they came to a point, there's only two of them that said, we can go. And the rest of them said no. And because of that disobedience, they spent another 38 years in the wilderness before they could cross into the promised land. There was, there was only Joshua who was able to cross into the promised land. Even Moses couldn't go in. Because all they knew is, well, at least we're not in Egypt at least we're not in Egypt. At least we're not slaves. And they get used to the wilderness. And they get used to this. And, and they think, well, yeah, it may not be where I want to be, but that is too unreachable. God made them walk 38 more years because they were disobedient. And said, we know there's more. But we don't have the faith to go there. There are people today who are safe and free from the bondage of sin. But you'll walk in circles all your life and not even think about pursuing the more. Because, well, that's too scary. It's disobedience. It's disobedience to hold the Holy Spirit at arm's length, just like the children of Israel did for 38 years. If you want to be like Jesus, and if you trust God, you'll walk into that unknown territory. You'll step into that deeper water. You'll do what you have to do to get wrong thinking out of your mind and say, God, here I come. Amen. I want it all, whatever it costs. You know, salvation is free. Discipleship costs you everything, but it's worth it.